Hello everyone, welcome to Speaking Of, a podcast where we talk about people's stories, perspectives, and ideas. I'm Charles Ladia, and every episode we will be joined by interesting individuals as they share their stories of being and becoming and how we can better understand them using theories and lenses in communication. And speaking of, in this episode, we will talk about the intersection of religion, politics, and protests. Maaari nga bang pagsabayin ang pananampalataya at ang protesta? What is the role and responsibility of a religious organization in times of politics and protests? We have Ms. Denise Chrysostomo, a speech communication instructor and researcher, as our guest. Let's start this conversation. Hi everyone, welcome to episode 5 of Speaking Of, where we will talk about the intersection of religion, politics, and protests. And our guest is a faculty member of the Department of Speech Communication and Theater Arts at the University of the Philippines, Diliman, and she does research on rhetoric and performance studies. Her master's piece is titled, From the Pulpit to the Streets, the Organizational Rhetoric of the United Church of Christ in the Philippines on Human Rights, Justice, Peace, during the Duterte presidency, discusses the role of religious rhetoric in shaping political participation and public opinion on human rights, justice, and peace. Please welcome to Speaking Of, Ms. Janice Chrysostomo. Hi, Janice. Hi, Charles. Hello to yes, all your to... listeners. Yes, welcome to Speaking Of. So our discussion right now is very timely, but also very controversial because of the intersections of two very powerful institutions in the Philippines, the church and Mm -hmm. politics, right? When we talk about uh, the constitution, the Philippine constitution, there's actually a mandate saying that there should be a separation between the state and the church. But then throughout history, right, from the Edsa People Power Revolution 1 and 2, we see how powerful and, and how influential the church is in political stances and even the making of policies in the Philippines. So why did you decide first to study something this big and something that could be this controversial? Okay, so the choice for my MA thesis topic was a journey in itself. Dahil I found it hard to find that one topic that is very close to my heart and at the same time um, can contribute a lot to our field of study and at the same time to society. So nag-start yung choice ko ng topic, isang Sunday, one regular Sunday morning. Okay, and uh, uh, yung dad ko is a pastor of the United Church of Christ in the Philippines. So habang nagsasermon siya, binasa niya ang isang official statement from the UCCP bishops. And that statement condemns the red tagging of UCCP. Okay? Dahil nung mga panahon na yon talamak yung paglilabel sa mga human rights advocates na sila ay komunista. Actually, noong panahon na yon talamak siya hanggang ngayon, di ba? So, yung relevance talaga niya nandiyan pa rin. Ngayon, nagtataka ako or na-realize ko, bakit nalilabel ang UCCP na communist in the first place? Diba ang church, ang tingin natin sa church are holy. Yes. Diba? Praise and worship, everything uh, divine and heavenly. Anong relationship ng church sa komunista, sa isang very political na institution or ideology? Ano bang mga ministries ng UCCP at ganito ang kanilang uh, iging role sa society? And bakit active ang church in calling out injustices? Kasi growing up, na-exposed din ako sa ganitong uh, uh, roles ng church. Shepherding Indigenous Peoples. Lumaki ako na tinuturo namin sa Vacation Church School. Yung mga summer um, programs ng church na nagpapakain kami sa mga bata ng community. Ang uh, mga uh, laman din ng mga ano namin, modules namin doon ay getting to know the lumads, taking care of the environment. So parang growing up, hindi, hindi ako nagugulat kung merong human rights, environmental issues na natuturo sa church. Yes. So, uh, 
nagmula ako dun sa point of view na yun, na wala pang masyadong nagre-research o sumusulat sa role ng Protestant churches, kagaya ng United Church of Christ in the Philippines, sa mga isyong panlipunan. Most of the time ay Catholic Church ang meron. At marami nito, ha? So, yeah. naisip ko na, ano kaya ang rhetoric at performances ng UCCP sa mga isyong panlipunan na nagagana? Yes. Junice, you're very close to this study, right? Mm-hmm. You are a pastor's daughter. You're also a researcher in the process, mm-hmm. diba? Tapos talagang nag-immerse ka towards that process, right? Yeah, right? Can you briefly tell us the methodology of the research? Paano mo talaga in-immerse yung sarili mo doon sa pag-aaral na ito? Okay, talagang immerse na immerse ako. Sabi ko nga ay mag-offer ako ng study on organizations in an emic perspective, yung insider's perspective. At syempre, dahil insider's perspective siya, nilagay ko pa rin sa aking uh, scope and limitations na ito ay personal opinions ko at hindi lahat ng members ng church may yeah. share the same opinions, diba? At syempre, dahil insider yon, dapat transparent tayo sa mga nagbabasa na research natin na, ah, member pala siya ng UCCP para meron din silang framing ng kung saan nagmumula yung researcher. Yeah. So yung methodology yeah. ko dito ay qualitative in nature. Nag-participant observation ako sa tatlong churches, tatlong UCCP churches, itong local church sa Malolos, sa Pampanga, tsaka sa Las Piñas. And nag-interview din ako ng pastors at mga bishop at isa nga sa mga bishops na yon ay taga Davao. Kaya nag-ano pa ako, lumipad-lipad pa ako papuntang Davao uh, before the pandemic. And meron ding mga taga Baguio, kaya uh, talagang medyo, eh, yun nga, sinasabi nga ni Charles na immersion talaga siya. And ano pa ang ginawa ko? Official statements, dinownload ko lahat from 2016, nung umupo si Duterte bilang uh, presidente. At kasama yun sa artifacts na ginawan ko ng rhetorical analysis. At syempre, pati yung mga documents ng UCCP simula pa nung martial law. Okay? Yeah, Para yeah. magkaroon lang ako ng mas um, uh, less naive perspective sa pagbabasa ko nung nun. So, um, when I was reading your study, di ba? I'm not quite familiar with UCCP kasi. So, na, ang very interesting sa akin, sabi mo nga kanina, they started, they started their political activity even during the martial law. Kasi ba doon mm-hmm. sa martial law, uh, most of the time it is the Catholic Church that was right. uh, that is in history. Diba? Si Cardinal Sin, pagtawag niya sa mga tao to go to EDSA. But um, can you briefly tell us, when was UCCP founded and what are the interesting uh, activities that they did early on in terms of politics? Okay, so the UCCP is different from uh, the Catholic churches that we have in the country right now because its roots are in the Protestant Reformation, okay, led by Martin Luther. So iba to dun sa Martin Luther King. Um, Martin Luther is a German professor of theology and Catholic priest who came to protest several teachings and practices of the Roman Catholic Church, yung indulgentia, indulgences. Okay, he strongly disputed the Catholic view on indulgences through his thesis. So, gumawin siya ng thesis actually. Yes, 95, 95 thesis. thesis. True. And uh, doon sa thesis na yon, in assert niya that salvation and eternal life are not earned by good deeds, but are received as a gift of grace from God through the Lord Jesus Christ. So, kaya nagkaroon ng Protestant Reformation. So, the Protestant faith was passed on to us Filipinos by American missionaries at the beginning of the 20th century. Kapag narinig nyo na yung mga terms na Presbyterian churches, familiar ba kayo dyan? Philippine Methodist churches, mga brethren, disciples, congregational churches. Ito yung mga pamana sa atin ng mga American missionaries. At noong 1948, dito na buo ang UCCP. It was formed as an indigenous evangelical church by these aforementioned Protestant mission churches and institutions. So ito, uh, kaya siya United Church. Kasi mm. parang United Protestant Churches, naging isang church lang sila. So it is through the unity among these Protestant churches that the UCCP was born. And since it is very community-centered, sabi mo nga, Junice, we cannot let go of the fact that some of the issues that it uh, that it faces uh, that it challenges are community centered sabi mo kanina environment indigenous yeah. people 
Kaya naman, marami ring issues that it wants to face centers on these very important political issues. But before we go to the political issues that it concerns with, the second one that I want to talk about is organizational rhetoric. Kasi diba, Junis, sabi mo kanina, not everyone identifies with the message of the church, lalo na when it goes to politics. Let's start first with, what is organizational rhetoric? And how do we apply it to religious organizations like UCC? Okay, first of all, I chose organizational rhetoric dahil wala pong masyadong gumagawa ng thesis on this um, specific theory or perspective. So I see it more like a perspective than a theory kasi uh, maraming mga theories talaga like identification na nagpo-fall under lang siya ng organizational rhetoric. Um, aside from wala ko masyadong gumagawa dito, ang original plan ko talaga ay maghanap ng isang tao na aaralin. Di ba ganun tayo usually? Yes. Guys? Rhetoric ni Lenny Robredo, yes. o rhetoric ni Cardinal Sin, laging person-centered. May naisip ko, paano naman kung organization yung gusto kong aralin? Di ba in itself, rhetorical actor ang mga churches, organizations, schools? So doon ko naisip na mag-search ng organizational rhetoric. At lumabas nga na kailangan pa nating mag-aral ng mga uh, about organizational rhetoric. So let me give you a definition of what it is. It's the strategic use of symbols by organizations to influence the thoughts feelings, and behaviors of audiences important to the operation of the organization. So usually, who are these audiences? First, internal audiences, yung mga members mo mismo, yung mga employees mo, kung wari kung ikaw ay isang corporate organization. Meron ding mga external audiences, like for example, the media, you have the general public, you have the government as well. So dapat inaaral din natin kung paano pinaposisyon ng organization ang kanyang role okay, in front of these audiences. So in my thesis, I emphasized on what symbols are being used by my church organization's rhetors. So na-identify ko na ang mga rhetors ng organization namin ay yung mga bishop na gumagawa ng statements. At syempre, yung mga church workers or pastors na nagsasalita every Sunday sa pocket yeah. in order to justify yung ministries ng Church on Justice and Peace. Ang pinaka-importante daw na dapat natin makita ay consubstantiation. Diba? Ito ay Burke yan. Diba? Yeah. Uh, theory ito ni Kenneth Burke. Ito ay identification theory. Na persuasion happens when you perceive yourself to be the same as the other. Kapag yung values mo, principles mo, yung version of the world as drama ay the same, doon sa pinapakita ng reader sa iyo nagkakaroon ng persuasion. And right. interestingly, kapag daw tayo ay members ng organizations, we see ourselves as one with the organization. Okay? And we see ourselves as ambassadors of the organization. So meron talaga dong identification. Yeah. So usually yun naman ang tinitingnan sa organizational rhetoric. Yeah. So Ma'am Junice, as I understand it, organizational rhetoric is basically the intersection of organizational communication and rhetoric, di ba? At right. very important yung sinasabi mo kanina that there are symbols that produce a collective identity of its mm-hmm. members and how these yeah. members actually perform these collective identities outside of the organization. So mm-hmm. in your case nga, UCCP yung iyong case study para dito sa study right. mo on organizational rhetoric. So let's talk about consubstantiation. Sinasabi mo kanina na not everyone in the organization believes in the same political ideologies as the source of the message, which would be the UCCP bishops and translated or promoted by the priests um, sa mga communities natin. So let's start first with the development of UCCP in their stance. Baakit nga ba controversial or political ang stance ng UCCP tungkol sa mga political issues na ito? So sige, tingnan natin yung um, findings ko sa interviews with pastors and bishops. Tsaka doon sa mga organizational documents ng UCCP using organizational rhetoric as my lens and consubstantiation. Paano nga ba inaassert ng mga bishops doon sa interviews namin na the same 
ang essence ng member at essence ng organization. It's important for you to note na nung ini-interview ko sila, tingin nila sa akin ay member ng church. Okay? Mm-hmm. So, talaga, ako talaga yung, um, uh, ano yun, yung recipient ng messages. Yes. Ito. Pero, Number uh, one, Denise, they are conscious naman that you're doing research, right? That's a part of yes. ethical obligation and doing right. research. Please continue. Mm-hmm. Um, ang ginawa ko pala, bago ko sa interviewin, syempre, binigyan ko sila ng letter kung ano objectives ng study and uh, kung willing silang ma-record sila and at the same time, kung willing silang yung name nila ay malagay sa study. So, alam nila lahat before everything. Okay, so ito yung mga lumabas. Number one, the rhetorical power of organizational history. Okay? So, ibig sabihin, kapag ang UCCP, sinasabi nila kung bakit ang mga Pilipino o ang mga members dapat may compassion sa mga naaapi, hindi lang nila sinasite lagi ay panay biblical agad. Okay? Hmm. O hindi nila panay sinasite lang ang constitution. Kasama dito ang organizational history. And I think it's a very interesting perspective. Number one, uh, lagi nilang sinasabi ng bishops and pastors that the UCCP is a pioneer in social analysis and theology. So what does that mean? Lagi nilang sinasabi in a positive light with pride na tayo ang pinakaunang church na 1950s pa lang. We uh, mix our theology with social critique. Okay. At noong 1950s pa lang, nagkakaroon na tayo ng understanding na, nag, na merong paparating na climate change, na merong uh, labor issues. Kaya pati within the simbahan, within the church, ay nire-recognize ang pastors, mga um, Jaconisa as workers, church workers. Dapat may karampatang sweldo, ganyan. So meron na silang um, social critique, meron silang um, pag-iisip na Uh, ang mga bagay na ito dapat tinitake into consideration. So yes. that's history. 1950s pa lang daw, um, nagbabarrow na tayo sa progressive theologians okay, na kung paano natin i-interpret ang social realities. And pangalawa, I think ito ang pinaka-importanting turning point ng UCCP sa kanyang justice, peace, and human rights advocacy. Okay, the narratives of a common past. Okay, using the church's lived experience of martial law. So, nung ini-interview ko sila, bakit po kailangan nating mag-protest uh, against martial law in Mindanao during Duterte's administration? Or uh, let's say, for example, yung nangyayaring pagpapatahimik sa mga aktivista o sa mga nag advocate ng human rights ay dahil nagmumutla ang kanilang perspective sa nangyari sa kanila years ago. So ano bang nangyari ng martial law? Marami pa lang mga pastor ng UCCP ang na-raid, na-torture at napatay dahil sila ay uh, mga pastor na um, ang kanilang mga parish ay nasa kabundukan. So ito yung mga diba, prone talaga sa uh, na-excommunicado, nawawala sa mga farmers di ba na kailangan nilang talaga mag-alsa para sa kanilang kabuhayan di ba sa mga indigenous peoples okay so marami talagang pastor na nawala and ibig sabihin ang organization meron tayong konsepto ng organizational heroes meron tayong hmm. organizational martyrs and sa UCCP yung mga pastor na uh, naging uh, martyr noong panahon ng martial law ay parang sila yung ideal members at kung member ka na UCCP, pag maririnig mo to, meron parang cathartic identification with yes. them. This emotional identification na, ay, grabe, nakakatouch naman yung buhay. Nakaka-inspire naman yung buhay nila. Dapat ganun din tayo. Um, Junis, before we go to the next one, right? Itong dalawang organizational rhetoric ay, of course, they are being spread using stories, sabi mo nga kanina, right? using narratives, right? In their, pro- in their sermons or maybe in official statements. And what I noticed is itong rhetorical power of organizational history at itong narratives of a common past, lalo na yung lived experience of martial law, it feels like UCCP is localizing um, its church towards what people actually experiences, right? Mm-hmm. Um, right? Very important ito doon sa consciousness, lalo na sa consubstantiation. Diba? Because people won't be able to identify with you if you're telling stories that they can't identify with. 
So very conscious yung organizational rhetoric ng UCCP sa experiences at sa history, mm-hmm. ba? Diba? Right. Ng Pilipino at ng mga audience nito. So let's continue with your observations. Right. So aside from history, ay meron ding konsepto ang church ng organizational identity. Okay, what does that mean? Um, while I was interviewing our pastors and bishops, malaming beses na compare and contrast nila ang UCCP sa ibang churches. Okay? So, ibig sabihin, rhetorical din pala yung compare mo yung organization mo sa iba. Ganito tayo, sila ganito. So, merong uh, sense of we and they. Okay? And itong sense of we na to, hindi lang nakareflect sa narratives, oral narratives ng uh, pastors. Ito din ay nakareflect sa ating constitution and bylaws ng simbahan. Meron ding Magna Carta, ang UCCP. Meron din tong vision, mission, and goals. At meron din siyang statement of faith na sa Pampanga, ito ay nakatarpolin at nakapost sa wall. At dito naman sa Malolos, ganun din. Nakatarpolin siya, nakapost din sa wall. Ibig sabihin talagang parang it's a message that everyone can see every time they right. go to church. So, right. na yung yeah, this is us. Yes, yes, and also this is very organizational, de ba? Talaga may formal right. structure. Meron tayong uh, written documents, mm-hmm. right? So this all belongs to organizational identity. Yes, because it talks about who we are. Mm-hmm. Right. At ang interesting dito, Charles, hindi lang siya nakapaskil sa wall para hindi pansinin. May mga seminars talaga na nagspring up lang early 2000s on UCCP Statement of Faith. Meaning, parang naging proyekto siya ng conference ng national um, uh, leadership na dapat meron tayong seminar sa members natin kung sino nga ba ang UCCP. And I think factor nito ay nagkakaroon na ng maraming mga Christian churches and marami na ring um, na, uh, nawawala sa traditional Protestant churches na lilipat sa iba. Kaya gusto nila na ina-assert sa seminars mm-hmm. kung sino ba tayo at bakit tayo iba. Right. Ngayon, when we talk when we talk about uh, justice and peace, makikita mo rin ito sa statement of faith ng UCCP, itong ang mga nakapaskil sa wall at nilalagay sa seminar, yung consciousness in uh, justice, consciousness with human rights and the peace. So okay lang ba nabasahin ko yung dalawa sa article? For sure. Statement sure. Pero na, na but, uh, as you are looking for it, mm-hmm. no? Itong values na ito ay very pronounced, right? Talagang justice, peace, and right. human rights ang ministry ng UCCP. So sige, Junice, read um, some statements. Right. So for one of the articles in the UCCP Statement of Faith, it, say, it says, We believe persons are created in the image of God and destined to live in community with God, with other persons, and with all creation. That by disobedience, they have become sinful, but by grace through faith, they are redeemed in Jesus Christ. That being entrusted with God's creation, they are called to participate in the establishment of a just and compassionate social order. So iyan ay nakalagay sa how will you perform being a UCCP? Mm. It's a statement of faith. So another article states, we believe that God is at work to make each person a new being in Christ and the whole world God's kingdom in which love, justice, and peace prevail. So, yun, very pronounced. And yes. talaga sa UCCP statement of faith, sa kanyang identity artifact, ang term na justice. That the kingdom of God is present where faith in Jesus Christ is shared. But it doesn't stop that, ah. Where healing is given to the sick, where food is given to the hungry, where light is given to the blind, and where liberty is given to the captive and oppressed. These are biblical. These are Bible verses from John. Okay? And dito rin naka-base kung ano ba ang mission ng UCCP. So these are organizational identity artifacts that the bishops and the pastors used to convince me, well, in the interview, that the Justice, Peace, and Human Rights Ministry is uh, a ministry ordained by God. Yeah. So nakikita natin yung connection from the Bible all the way to the personal experiences of uh, these right. creators, all the way to the personal experiences of the audience members. So itong right. organizational identity kasi, as, as we can see, it's not just in religious organizations, di ba? Even universities. Yung pag sinasabi natin, 
uh, this university is better than this university, meron ding aspect ng um, organizational identity. Even so, when yeah. students, right? So, ibig mm-hmm. sabihin, uh, the church or UCCP is very vocal regarding their vision, their mission, specifically on how do they maintain all of these memberships, lalo nang, uh, sabi mo nga kanina, 1.5 million members across the Philippines. And I think worldwide, right? Mm-mm. So when I was reading your study, I also came across the connection between biblical, kasi syempre, pag church, kailangan babalik ka talaga sa Bible. Diba? Tapos may mga nabasa ako dito, and uh, I will read on these aspects on the symbols and connection between the church, the Bible, and these values, like human rights are God's gift that must be safeguarded, Christ sides with the poor and the oppressed, opposing unjust powers is prophetic witnessing, and justice-based peace is the establishment of God's kingdom on earth. So how are these messages performed and promulgated inside your church? Sa sermons lang ba? Sa mga nakalagay lang ba sa teachings? sa tarpaulin. So, paano ito pinapakalat through organizational rhetoric? Okay. So, when it comes to organizational rhetoric and uh, the performance aspect of it, the embodied aspect of it, um, we also have organizational rules, also known as mergers. How do we merge ourselves with organizations? Dahil sa mga tasks na binibigay sa atin, dahil sa mga labels na meron tayo sa organization. Like, for example, move muna tayo sa DSCTA. Ikaw, coordinator ka. Ako, assistant chair. So, yun yeah. lang meron tayong tasks sa organization. It's already a form of being one with the organization because you represent the organization, its values, and you spend time and your life di ba, working for it. Okay? So, members ident- identify themselves with assigned roles, commitments, responsibilities, merging individual identity with organizational identity. So one example would be uh, church workers or pastors are labeled in the documents as shepherds. Okay, mm. Shepherds not only for the spiritual aspect but also for uh, the social civic aspects. Kapag may kailangan na uh, tulong sa let's say legal aspects, pwede ka lumapit kay pastor para ma-refer ka sa mga members na lawyers. Diba? So, mga ganun mga klaseng aspects. And also, uh, kapag bishop ka, meron kang roles in the UCCP Magna Carta, sa bylaws, kung ano ang kailangan gawin ng isang UCCP bishop. Meron din tayong conference ministers, meron tayong president ng mga organizations. Diba? So, we also merge ourselves in these uh, roles. Now, what are the other embodied performances of the UCCP when it comes to human rights, justice, and peace. Sabi nga, sabi mo nga, Charles, hindi lang siya nag-end, di ba, na nag-release ng official statement saying that they condemn the red tagging uh, done by the state or they release an official statement saying that we must defend the LUMAD communities we have in Davao. It doesn't end there. So I think one uh, observation are the rallies and protests that these UCCP pastors and bishops participate in. So, opo, sumasali sila sa mga protesta. As in, nagmamarcha sila kasama ang mga mamamayang Pilipino. At dahil nagtitisis ako noong SONA 2019, SONA ng bayan, mm-hmm. dinakilahok ako sa protesta. At interestingly, sa tinagal-tagal ko sa UP, before ako nagtisis, hindi nila ako na hatak papunta sa Menjola o sa outside the campus ng mga protests. Pero nung nakita ko, nag-delve in pa sa thesis at nakita ko na yung mga pastor pala ay uh, protesta nagkaroon ng persuasion sa akin eh. So hindi pala siya, yeah. hindi pala siya clashing with my Christian beliefs kasi that, so nung nakita ko to, na-expose ako lalo sa mga messages kasi isipin nyo yun, isang taon ako na-expose dito sa mga justice, yeah. peace, human rights at nung nagtawag ng protest, talagang willingly na ako sumama. Yes. Tapos, na- Junice, ibig yeah. sabihin din, you also underwent the process of consubstantiation, lalo't lalo na in all right. of these processes, right? With right. your exposure, with the messages, with a different perspective, no? Feeling ko mm-hmm. nag-ibang perspective mo. So, later we'll talk about that. Right. So, ako din, I think ako ay testimony na na-persuade ako 
<laughs> nung mga na-encounter ko na mga messages. Okay, so rallies and protests uh, are part of it. Ang naalala ko nung nag-join kami sa Sona ay nakasuot ng pangpastor, ang mga pastor namin. At mm. uh, sila ay uh, nakalagay sa front lines ng Sona ng bayan. At nung sinabi ni Ma'am Wawi, my, uh, one of my panelists in this thesis, siya ay activist talaga at talagang uh, umaaten siya sa mga ganitong klaseng rally. Talagang nilalagay nila ang mga taong simbahan sa pinakaharap ng lahat ng protesta. Dahil ito daw ay isang magandang uh, mensahe, ito ay symbol na ang pinaglalaban ng masang Pilipino ay merong uh, hininga ng Diyos. Parang it's, uh, it's not bad, it's not evil, God has ordained this. So makita natin na may pag uh, pag costume dahil talagang all out na yes. ka pastor's robes at katabi namin yung mga madre naman from Catholic. At ang sinisigaw noon, ang tao, ang bayan kasama ang simbahan. So meron ding uh, nakita ko din dito na ang UCCP sa lahat ng mga um, ministries niya, pinapakita niya na hindi kami iba sa isang regular na Pilipino. Hindi kami iba hmm. sa mga uh, walang makain. Hindi kami iba sa mga naaapi. Kami ay right. nakikilakad, nakikimarcha, nakiki, nakikisalamuha ba sa isang kung anong tunay na Pilipino. You know? So aside yes. from rallies and protests, meron ding mga spaces tayong tinatawag performance of spaces, lalo na ang pag-open ng church doors for indigenous peoples. Yes. Ba? Hindi lang naman nasa body natin ang performances, nasa meaning din na nilalagay natin sa mga spaces natin. So ano ba itong uh, opening of doors? So in Davao City, in UCCP Haran, Haran stands for Home and Altar for Renewal, Action and Nature. Dahil nandun sila sa Davao, um, nag-welcome sila ng 500 lumads okay, for sanctuary dahil ang kanilang ancestral domain merong war, ang NPA at ang military. And wala silang mapuntahan na safe na lugar. Kaya binuksan ng simbahan ng kanilang church. ba diba? para ang weird yun dahil when we talk about church, dapat walang maingay, dapat laging malinis. Ano pa ba? Yung tingin natin sa church, parang holy, holy, diba? Oo, oh, yeah. tsaka yung damit mo, dapat parang maayos ka. And dapat apolitical. Diba ganun yung tingin natin? Pero kapag binuksan mo yung doors mo at ang nakatira na sa space na yon ay yung mga sinasabi na state-labeled enemies. Di ba ito isang performance talaga of consubstantiality also with these people. Okay, kaya naman nare-red tag talaga ang UCCP dahil ang kanilang identification are also with the Lumads, with the, the human rights advocates. Yun, so ang ginagawa nilang um, embodied practice ay nakikipamuhay sila sa urban poor. So naalala ko si Dad na wala siya for two weeks. Nakitira siya sa sitwasyon ng isang pamilya na talagang super hirap nila. So kung ano daw yung kakainin ng pamilya, yun din yung kakainin nila. Kung walang makain, wala silang kakainin. And si dad din, nag, uh, ano din sila, immersion din sila sa mga aita or two to three weeks. So nalaman nyo kung ano yung mga kinakain ng mga aita, yung lamok, kakagating ka daw talaga. Yung mga ganong klaseng bagay. So when we talk about consubstantiality nga dito, hindi lang yung yung mga words sa statements mo, ito yung nagka-cluster with UCCP. Let's say, ang clustering niya ay the poor, the marginalized. Hindi lang sa words, eh. hindi lang sa realm of words, kundi sa realm of the embodied kasi nakikipamuhay yes. ka sa mga taong yes. to. Ang interesting pa, yung mga youth camps. Although hindi ako naka-attend, nakikita ko sa mga posts ng mga friends ko na UCCP and also sa mga documents. Ay, aside from message of salvation. Di ba ganun yung mga youth camps and praise yes. and worship and then you accept Christ. After nung ganong parts ng mga guest speakers, may immersion sila and the one particular um statement din no 2016 ay nagpunta ang mga kabataan sa Hacienda Luisita at tinanong nila yung mga farmers sa kanilang mga pinagdaraanan. Meron din sa mga lumad sa Davao, pupunta din sila diyan. So after mo marinig yung message of salvation, papakita sa yung realities of uh, uh, the world. Ito at na yung paano mundo. natin mapapasok yung uh, yung gospel na okay na save ka. Okay, ganito yung yes. nangyayari sa mga Aita. Okay, nasave ka ngayon, afterlife, ganyan-ganyan, eternity. Pero ito yung pinagdaraanan ng mga lumads 
So, syempre, as a person, ikaw din mismo, marirealize mo na hindi lang yung afterlife yung dapat mong iniisip bilang Kristiyano, kundi how do I become like Christ? How do I become consubstantial with Christ himself? Dahil yes. ang mission nga ni Christ dati, di ba, ay uh, naki, nakipamuhay din siya sa mga may hirap, sa mga sinners, uh, sa least, last, and lost of his time. Hindi siya nahihiya na makipagsalamuha sa mga lepers, di ba? So, dapat ganito din daw tayo. So, it's about embodying Christ as well. Yes. So, grabe yung pagbaba, no? Pagbaba pa lang, parang, mas sabi mo nga kanina, mas pinaparamdam yung realidad, lalo na sa kabataan, lalo na sa mga miyembro. Right. And um, in the past few years, di ba, lalong mas naging controversial ang UCCP dahil nga yes. nare-red tag din siya na uh, sumusuporta sa mga komunidad na ito. Right. Junice, how do you think these people accept or reject these political ideologies and narratives? At sa research mo ba, may mga nakasalabuha ka who are not comfortable with this kind of organizational rhetoric? Interestingly, ang mga in-interview ko din na members, hindi lang pastors and bishops, members din, humanap ako ng mga government critics tsaka mga hmm. Duterte supporters talaga para walang bias sa yung study ko. Yes. Okay? Yes. And ang nakikita ko, nagpe-play ang cognitive dissonance sa mga members din. So let's start muna sa mga, let's say, Duterte supporters na members. Tapos makikita nila na yung kanilang mga bishops ay magre-release ng statement anti-government. So ang nangyayari yes. sa kanila, first of all, ay iniisip nila na ito ay trabaho lang ng bishop. Interesting yun, ba? Oo. Yes. That Trabaho nila I mean. yan, kaya nila ginagawa yan. But regardless, mm-hmm. this is my stand. So, ibig okay. sabihin, performance nila yan, they're performing their job. Okay. It's not a personal thing. And dyan din, papasok yung concept ng organizational democracy. Sa UCCP kasi, um, nakapattern tayo talaga sa, ayaw natin ang mga diktador, di ba? Mm-hmm. Ayaw natin ang mga, inaalisan tayo ng free will. Dahil hindi ganyan ang design sa human beings, okay? Meaning, ito ang sasabihin ng bishops, pero bahala ka kung tatanggapin mo o hindi. Mm. May interesting siya, di ba? Yes. Kaya, even though ang bishops natin ay very vocal sa mga nangyayaring social issues, meron tayong mga members na parte ng Duterte government. So, anong ibig sabihin nito? Hindi lang human rights, justice, and peace ang order na gusto nga establish ng organization but also democracy and peace within the church. At papasok din dito na maging ang mga pastor ay merong sariling boses. Sila ang gatekeepers ng information information in a local church. Meaning, although ang organization ng UCCP ay isang national nationwide church, ang bawat local church na pupuntahan mo ay kanya-kanya ng kultura at kanya-kanya ng mga pinapaniwalaan. So that is why ako din growing up, di ba? Yung mga naging na-assign sa aming pastors ay conservative sila. Okay? And ayaw nilang masyado na nailalapat sa mga members ang mga ganitong klasing messages. Kaya lumaki ako na ang tingin ko pa rin sa nagpo-protesta ay hindi Christian thing. Ngayon lang na nakita ko straight from the bishops ang mga statements ng church at ang meaning talaga ng nakapaskil sa wall namin, na-realize ko na, oh my gosh, hindi naman pala masama na magprotesta kung merong mali. So aside from that, di ba, na ang bawat local church ay may kanya-kanyang kultura at merong democracy din na dapat establish. Para siyang may tensions eh. Makikita mo yeah. talaga na ang rhetoric hindi siya transmission na sinabi ng rhetoric tapos ikaw na-persuade ka tapos woo, change. Hindi siya ganun eh. Meron ding internal um, uh, persuasion ng tao. Susunod, yung mga uh, Duterte supporters din na nakaka-encounter nito, uh, iniisip din nila na ang membership nila ay sa local church nila, hindi sa national church. At yung local church nila, ang mission nila ay nagpapakain sila sa mga bata dito every Saturday. Yun. Kaya sila, member pa rin ako na UCCP. Yeah. Pero I identify with my local church, not, not with the national church. 
So makita natin may levels din of identification, may levels yeah. of organization. So gumagawa sila internally ng ganito. And for example, ang um, sasabihin ng mga bishops, si Duterte ay um nag uh, ano siya, yung kanyang mga policies ay neoliberal, hininto niya ang peace talks para sa mga supporters ni Duterte ay ang kontrabida pa rin ay ang NPA kasi kaya na hinto ang peace talks dahil hindi sila nakipag-cooperate. So, meron din silang, ano yun, tawag doon? Um, sarili silang lens to interpret. Hindi sarili silang lens. Right, and messages. kung ikaw ay member ng UCCP at Duterte supporter ka, hindi ka ipapunish. Hindi ka papaalisin sa simbahan. Iba sa ibang simbahan, ito na din tayo sa We Day. Sa ibang simbahan, may isa lang dapat yung tingin nyo sa politika. So, ang interesting dito, lumabas din ito na organizational identity rhetoric. Na okay lang na ganito tayo sa church, na ang mga members hindi laging nakikinig sa bishop. Dahil tayo, hindi katulad ng iba, na kung anong sinabi nung nasa taas, dapat sumunod lahat ng members. So, ibig yes. sabihin nun ay identity din ng UCCP na okay lang na iba-iba ng iniisip o pinapaniwala. So even inside organizational rhetoric, meron ding conflict na ganon, di ba? And I'm right. sure um, they are experiencing this conflict in their um, aim to survive, di ba? All of these organizations right. aim to survive. Lalo na, um, mag-stick ba tayo dito sa political ideology na ito or we will let the members decide for their own on what political ideology will they take Uh, very right. interesting din sinabi mo kanina na very localized yung UCCP. Bahala yung priest kung ano yung isa-sermon yes. niya, kung pabasahin niya ba. At mm. maluwag yung church doon sa pagtanggap na iyon. Dahil nga, di ba, it's, it's also a reflection of justice, human rights, right. and peace. So talagang ine-embossed and, pa from the national level oh. all the way to the local level. Yes. Yeah. Titignan mo, Charles, yung mga official statements ng UCCP. Nakita ko to na talagang yung rhetoric at yung embodied practices ay iisa. Dahil kapag they are pertaining to pastors and bishops in the statements, okay, resulta to na cluster criticism, ha? ang nakakonekta na words ay prophets and shepherds. Okay? Mm-hmm. Prophets in a way na para kang si Moses na nagsasalita in front of Pharaoh. Para kang si Jeremiah na you talk to kings about what they should do and about the lamentations of your people. So, mayroong political note yes. kapag pastors and bishops yung nasa official statements. Okay? And shepherding, dahil kailangan mo din silang ilid not only in the yes. spiritual, but also in the social. But, yung mga UCCP members na term, kung makikita mo yung mga nakaklusters sa kanya na words, be prayerful, be vigilant. So, walang masyadong Um, assertion na kailangan mo maging um, involved yes. dun sa ganitong klaseng mga mission. So, dun pa lang sa official statements, nakikita na natin na ang requirement talaga sa bishops at sa uh, mga higher-ups na pastor ay meron silang um, capability and wisdom to to see social reality in this kind of theological reflection and to do missions regarding this. But UCCP members are never, never, ever forced to put themselves or participate in these missions. So yes. nakikita siya at uh, I think nagiging performative yung ganitong klaseng clusters sa mga official statements pa lang na nakikita ko na ganito nga yung kultura sa aming church. So it is right to say, Junice, na this organizational rhetoric stays in the organization no matter who who, who the bishop would be or who the priest would be. So, ibig sabihin, itong organizational rhetoric na ito from the 1950s pa will still go on. So, ibig sabihin ba, Janice, the consistency of the organizational rhetoric is a good indication of the health and strength of an organization? Um, I think consistency, but with an eye for change. Okay? So I think meron namang mga parts na hindi na applicable sa present day. Okay. Actually, the Bible itself, Biba, is, uh, is uh, a, a, a work about social issues. Pero 
iba na yung panahon sa Bible sa panahon ngayon. So it's about contextualizing these symbols, the, these places, these roles into what's happening in the present. Yes. I think that's so it. talagang rooted in the history, sabi mo nga kanina, mm-hmm. rooted in the lived experiences of the present, but open to changes in the future. Right. Yes. So to conclude our podcast for uh, this episode, can religion and politics intersect? I think ang sagot ko diyan ay everything is political. So uh, hindi talaga pwedeng paglayuin ang religion and politics. Dahil even churches, yung internal political dynamics, say for example, merong pastor at member. Iyan ay political na dahil power relation na yun. And even when you invite politicians into your church to pray for them, for how different is that to opening your doors to state-labeled enemies such as the Lumads, diba? Meron kang binubuksang pintuan at meron kang pinapapasok. And I think that's political. And if you're going to look at your pastor's language when they deliver their sermons, kung English, diba? Diba it talks about who attends your church and the socioeconomic status of your members, their educational attainment, their concerns in life, their privileges, their priorities. And also look at the location of your church, di ba? Mm. Political din yan eh. Ang performance of mission ng isang church na nakasituate sa BGC, sa Ortigas, or even sa Katipunan, iba yan sa mission ng isang church na napapagitnaan ng armed conflict sa isang bundok, di ba? Iba ang role ng pastor dyan. Hindi pwedeng pare-pareha. So it's really a political thing. As a church, we must also be mindful of uh, these power relations, of our privilege. And uh, I think when we participate in protests, it's not just a result of uh, how we uh, molded symbols in the rhetorical realm, but also in the experiences of politics in everyday life. So intersections of religion and politics it just lies in this specific uh, idea. Everything is political. Religion is always political. Right. So ang takeaway point ko dito sa ating podcast ay itong organizational rhetoric, right? Um, for our listeners, you can actually become reflective sa mm-hmm. sarili mong organization, sa religious organization mo man yan, or sa student organization mo, or sa university organization mo, even in your corporate organization. How do you think these institutions communicate right, membership, leadership, and organization towards you? And that is something mm-hmm. that we should also be conscious about because organizational rhetoric speaks a lot about an organization. Diba? Yung democracy man niya, yung welcoming mm-hmm. man niya. At sabi mo nga kanina, yung idea ng power dynamics around you. Right? Right? Last question. As a member and as a research, as a member of the UCCP and as a researcher, what was your overall reflection in doing and in presenting this research? So, I think uh, itong sasabihin ko, hindi ko pa nasabi kanina, and uh, dito ko ipapasok kasi kanina yung perspectives ng Duterte supporters eh. Ito naman yung mga perspectives ng hindi ka Duterte supporter like me. So ang reflection ko dito sa aking experience uh, working on these cases is that kung hindi ka Duterte supporter, if you are if you identify as a progressive, if you are already an activist in the first, first place and na-receive mo ang mga uh, messages na ito from your church UCCP, mare-reinforce yung beliefs mo in two ways. Number one, marireinforce lalo yung identification mo with the marginalized sa pinaglalaban mo. As in, sobra. Kapag nareceive mo yung mga messages na even Jesus was there for the least, last, and lost, you will feel this intense uh, emotional um, attachment to these advocacies. And second, hindi lang dito sa advocacy, hindi lang identification with the marginalized ang um, ma-achieve, but also a stronger identification with the, the church. Kapag nalaman mo yung simbahan mo, hindi taliwas sa mga prinsipyo mo, sa values mo, at pareho kayo ng pinaniniwalaan, magiging proud ka talaga na UCCP ka, magiging proud ka na ito yung simbahan mo ever since uh, martial law. Diba? Parang you're like, living 
uh, the church's legacy. Okay, and uh, of course, ang overall reflection ko din that our organizations, your school, your church, um, your company, it will shape the way you understand the world and how you perform your place in it. That's why it's very important for you to be critical of what uh, these rhetors, organizational rhetors, also tell you. And overall, as a Christian, yung thesis na to, it reminded me of Jesus Christ. Very timely dahil pinifilm natin to Holy Week, di ba? Who died for me on the cross. My personal Savior. Di ba? My eternity is Christ. But he himself did a very political thing. A very political move. And what is it? Letting go of his kingship and living with his people as a human being. As a Jewish carpenter. Di ba? Of all socioeconomic status na pwede pagpilian ng Diyos. Isang mahirap. Diba? Naging mahirap siya. He let go of his privileges of uh, heaven to become poor and what? To feed the hungry, to release the captives, to give sight to the blind, and to show the hypocrisy of religious and powerful leaders of his time. Kaya I think itong thesis na to, lagi ko na lang itatanong sa sarili ko ang question na kung si Christ ay kasama natin ngayon sa Pilipinas in present day society, nasaan siya? At ano ang ginagawa niya? Yeah, thank you very much, Ma'am Janice. Um, that's a very thought-provoking last question for everyone, which of course is a reflection of the organizational rhetoric of UCCP and your learnings and your pieces as well. Thank you very much, Janice, for sharing your thank stories you. of being and becoming. And thank you very much to our listeners. I do hope you take away one thing or two about organizational rhetoric and the rhetoric of UCCP in the Philippines. Thank you and see you in our next episode. Bye!